Previously known as the Christian world, Western society has seen a marked erosion in religious belief, including a loss of trust in the text upon which its culture was founded, the Bible. This occurred over the past century, but particularly since the end of World War II. Yet many people around us, young and old, logically deduce that there must be some intelligent cause behind the complex life forms on our planet. The design they see in the biosphere with all its interdependent systems, as well as the unbelievable complexity just within a human cell alone, induces the question, can this be the product of a cosmic accident or blind chance? In California, one can marvel at the complex mechanics that enable a giant redwood tree to lift tons of water hundreds of feet in the air. Note a statement from Nature Program. Water is pretty heavy, yet the redwood tree moves thousands of gallons of water, that is 8,000 pounds or four tons, up into its canopy every day and does it without doing any work. Whether it is the mechanics of cell division at the microscopic level, or a giant redwood tree's ability to move huge amounts of water hundreds of feet in the air, these are engineering marvels. It would be an odd accident indeed to produce this level of structure and design in a living and self-replicating organism. Many reasonable people, along with growing numbers of scientists, recognize there must be a designer behind the creation of which we are a part. The website, Descent from Darwin, provides a formal statement. We are skeptical of claims for the ability of random mutation and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. Careful examination of the evidence for Darwinian theory should be encouraged. That statement has been endorsed by a long line of scientists holding PhDs in fields such as mathematics, physics, chemistry, bioengineering, and philosophy. A printout of the list of names is currently at 28 pages and growing. But if we are the product of design and not blind chance, then who is this creator? Does he communicate with mankind? For centuries, many have looked to the text composed of ancient writings called the Bible as the creator's communication with mankind. Others dismiss it as a set of writings of a primitive people. The Bible, however, is unique in religious literature in that its pages contain specific predictions, some made 4,000 years ago, of events that were to happen, and some that are still to happen. Numerous of its predictions did in fact occur, sometimes centuries after they were written down. Hence the Bible stands either vindicated or condemned by the success or failure of its predictions. In today's program, we will examine a prediction of an event that would have seemed impossible at the time it was made, but which came to pass in remarkable detail years later. If what this program is about to reveal is in fact true, and archaeology testifies that it is so, then perhaps one might take the book in which the prediction was written, along with its instructions for life, a bit more seriously. Stay tuned for a remarkable story that shocked the archaeological world. We have shown recently in previous programs that the Bible is really a foundational building block of what we call Western culture. Does the text called the Bible indeed have any real validity, any worth to people living in the 21st century? Is it just a set of myths and legends from a simpler people in a more primitive time? Does it have any historical accuracy? Is there a reason to consider this book a text which contains information that deserves study and consideration? By the early part of the 19th century, the philosophers of the rationalist movement had relegated the Bible to being nothing more than a collection of mythologies from long past civilizations, ideas which had no relevance in a modern world. They expressed the position that the Bible was an historical fantasy, its stories fictional, and that many of the civilizations it mentions never existed. Near the middle of the 19th century, often working under harsh and hostile conditions, 
Teams of early archaeologists began occasional expeditions in the Middle East, searching for the remains of civilizations that many of their compatriots felt were mere legend. In 1840, a French diplomat named Paul-Emile Botta, in what was then the Ottoman Empire, which today is northern Iraq, sponsored a small project to examine some large mounds along the bank of the Tigris River near a town called Khorsabad. He was interested in the site as some local farmers had inadvertently uncovered what appeared to be the remains of immense pillars. Bota led an investigation and after some hard digging in 1844, discovered a trove of clay tablets inscribed with very ancient cuneiform script. Upon further investigation, it turned out that he had found the remains of the great palace and fortified city of the fabled Assyrian king, Sargon II, who conquered the northern kingdom of Israel in 721 BC. Not long afterward, the great English archeologist, Henry Layard, working close to Bota's site, found what is now called the Black Obelisk of Assyrian king Shalmaneser III, who reigned from 858 to 824 BC. The obelisk turned out to be a monument to the Assyrian victories and domination over Israel and Syria. The writing on the obelisk specifically references King Jehu of Israel and King Hazael of Syria paying tribute to the Assyrian king. Suddenly, it became blatantly obvious to all that the historical accounts in the biblical books of Kings and Chronicles had been accurately recording the history of nearly 3,000 years ago. The writings of prophets like Isaiah, Nahum, and others speaking of wars with Assyria and Syria moved from being myth to history. A few years after Layard's remarkable discovery of the magnificent Assyrian capital city of Nineveh, an Ottoman archeologist and Oxford graduate, Hormuz Razum, who had first worked for Layard, unearthed one of the greatest archaeological finds of all time. His treasure was not gold and jewels, but the royal library of Assyrian king Ashurbanipal, the last great Assyrian king who ruled from 669 to 631 BC, extending his empire to Cyprus, Iran, and Egypt. The library consisted of about 30,000 clay tablets, after being transported to London's British Museum in 1861, they were put under the care of curator George Smith, who was able to read the ancient script. While sorting through the tablets and fragments, he was shocked to discover a story about a great flood similar to the biblical narrative of Noah and the Ark. Smith later gave a lecture on the discovery, which was attended by then British Prime Minister William Gladstone. It gave further corroboration of accounts that had been previously dismissed as old Hebrew myths. Today, we find similar records of such a deluge event in traditional Chinese records, and even among ancient records of indigenous peoples in the Americas. Even more interesting than the discovery that the nations and their kings mentioned in the biblical record actually existed, is the finding that what was predicted to happen to some of these nations can now be shown to have taken place with uncanny precision. One of the books of the Bible is called Nahum. It is a very short text, but it is a prediction of the fall of Nineveh. Most biblical scholars date this work sometime between 650 and 620 BC. For much of this period, Ashurbanipal was the Assyrian king, and he extended that empire and its wealth. Therefore, at the time Nahum wrote his predictions of a catastrophic collapse of Assyria and the destruction of Nineveh, such an event would have seemed impossible, the ravings of a lunatic. Yet Layard and the later archaeologists of the Malawan expeditions in the 1930s and early 1950s were stunned by the apparent accuracy of the predictions made in Nahum's writing. He had foretold a short siege and the total devastating collapse of Nineveh. What made this such an unrealistic prophecy? Dr. Henry Holly, basing himself on the descriptions of ancient historians like Diodorus Siculus and Herodotus, 
gives the following description of Nineveh as it would have been around 630 BC. The term Nineveh refers to the whole complex of associated villages served by one great irrigation system and protected by the one network of fortifications based on river defenses. Greater Nineveh was about 30 miles long and about 10 miles wide, protected by five walls and three moats. Jonah's mention of 120,000 babes suggested might have had a population of near a million. The inner city, about three miles long and one and a half miles wide, was protected by walls 100 feet high, eight miles in circuit. Dodora Siculus, writing in the first century BC, recorded that three chariots could drive abreast the 50-foot thick walls overlooking a 150-foot inner moat. Twenty-story watchtowers at regular intervals monitored the inner defenses of that titanic inner fortress. In 721 BC, the king of Assyria's sledgehammer smashed even the once invincible northern kingdom of Israel and killed or enslaved most of its citizens. Sometime after this conquest, a man named Nahum wrote a short scroll which was later included in the Hebrew Bible. The scroll contained what was a stunning prediction. According to scholar Gleason Archer, it was most likely written about 654 BC, when Assyria and its capital Nineveh were at the apex of their power. Some think Nahum was an Israelite living under Assyrian captivity, while others infer that he was living in Judah, which was still independent. Whichever the case, the content of Nahum's prophecy would have been difficult to believe. The scroll would seem to be the work of madness. The prophet was predicting Nineveh's catastrophic fall at a time when its empire had few contenders for power and the city of a million people was considered impregnable against any military technology of the day. So what did Nahum predict, and what did the archaeologists record they found? Nahum predicted that the city would fall quickly. All your strongholds are fig trees with ripened figs. If they are shaken, they fall into the mouth of the eater. This depiction of a swift collapse was astonishing. Cities far less powerful than Nineveh had great success holding out against sieges and Nineveh's size and defenses were far superior. Most walled cities were designed and supplied to withstand sieges of years in length. Alexander the Great besieged Tyre for three years. The Philistine city of Ashdod resisted Egypt for 29 years. But Nineveh, the best defended and supplied city of the time, was predicted to fall swiftly. Nahum predicted that drunkenness would be a factor in Nineveh's collapse. For while tangled like thorn, and while drunken like drunkards, they shall be devoured like stubble, fully dried. And you also will be drunk. Nahum predicted that there would be drunkenness among the defenders. Nahum predicted that a terrible flood would be a factor in the city's fall. But with an overflowing flood, he will make an utter end of its place, and darkness will pursue his enemies. And the gates of the rivers are opened and the palace is dissolved. These passages show Nahum's prediction that the city's demise would involve the river. Nahum predicted that fire would play prominently in the city's destruction. The gates of your land are wide open for your enemies. Fire shall devour the bars of your gates. Nineveh was to be devoured by fire. Nahum predicted that the fall of Nineveh would be its end. It would never be rebuilt. Your injury has no healing. Your wound is severe. All who hear news of you will clap their hands over you, for upon whom has not your wickedness passed continually. Many ancient cities experienced defeat and destruction, yet were built again upon the ruins of the former structures. Damascus, Jerusalem, and Aleppo, to name but a few, were all destroyed some multiple times, yet were rebuilt. Nahum, however, predicted that the attack on Nineveh would not only be successful, but the totally destroyed city would never rise again. Nahum predicted that 
Even Nineveh's ruins would disappear as if it had never been. The Lord has given a command concerning you. Your name shall be perpetuated no longer. Out of the house of your gods, I will cut off the carved image and the molded image. I will dig your grave, for you are vile. Finally, he predicted that this huge and powerful metropolis would not only be subject to defeat, but it would disappear from the presence of mankind as an inhabited city. At the time Nahum would have written these words, they might well have been considered sheer folly. Yet what have archaeologists uncovered? In a few moments, we will examine the incredible discoveries that showed the words of Nahum came true exactly as he stated. Clearly, the statements of Nahum when compared to the archaeological record should cause a reasonable person to consider the prophecies of the Bible with a bit more seriousness. Our special offer today is a DVD, also available for download, entitled The Power of Prophecy. It contains three programs which give further reason to conclude the predictions of the Bible are far more than idle words, but are in fact messages of warning and hope that one can take to heart. For today's free offer, call 888-459-5726 or go to twtv.org power. This clear and straightforward resource will help you understand this vital truth straight from the pages of the Bible. If you're calling for the first time, you will also receive a free subscription to Tomorrow's World magazine. This inspiring magazine discusses news, science, and modern culture, and will help you make sense of your world from a biblical perspective. Call today and join millions around the world who are turning to Tomorrow's World for truth, prophecy, and hope in these confusing times. Call now or go to twtv.org slash power. On today's program, we have been looking at historical writings that describe the grandeur and power of the Assyrian capital city of Nineveh. We also looked at six predictions of a somewhat obscure Hebrew prophet named Nahum, who wrote of the future fall of the Assyrian Empire and the utter desolation of its magnificent capital. The massive city fortress of Nineveh, home to over a million people, defended by the core of the feared Assyrian army, should have seemed invincible. Based upon the work of archaeologists who have been excavating at the sites of Assyrian cities for over a century, and a review of ancient historical records, the following facts have been uncovered. The length of the siege. In 612 BC, a Babylonian-led force, in alliance with Medes and also Scythians, attacked and enveloped Nineveh. The city should have been able to withstand a very long siege of years in length. It was protected by huge walls, massive water barriers, and had access to an immense food supply. The land of Assyria was known for its food production in the ancient world. Herodotus, the famed historian of ancient Greece, recording accounts of the region told to him around 450 BC, writes, As a grain-bearing country, Assyria is the richest in the world. So great is the fertility of the grain fields that they normally produce crops of 200-fold. The blades of wheat and barley are at least three inches wide. The only oil these people use is made from sesame. Date palms grow everywhere, and the fruit supplies them with food, wine, and honey. Despite defenses, armed force, and massive food stocks, the city fell in a remarkably short time. The city was comprehensively sacked after a three-month siege, and Assyrian king Sinsharushkin was killed. This was a very brief siege, fulfilling Nahum's first remarkable prediction. What happened to the feared Assyrian army? We saw that Nahum had predicted that drunkenness would play a part in the final fall of the city. In the text, Evidence Demands a Verdict, page 310 and 311, authors Josh and Sean McDowell make this comment based on ancient historians. 
Camped outside the city walls, the king of Assyria became lax in his vigilance and began to indulge with his soldiers in much drinking. With great success, the enemy general routed the disorganized camp, battle decided entirely by the Assyrian drunkenness. Nahum's prediction of drunkenness being a major factor is supported by history. The river in a flood. Nahum, as we read earlier, predicted that a major flood would be one of the causes of the city's sudden collapse. After the defeat outside the wall due to the intoxication of the army, the Assyrians regrouped inside the first perimeter wall. But just as Nahum predicted in chapter 1, verses 8 and 10, Dodorus Siculus explained that, After heavy rains, the river broke down a distance of the city walls. The siegers, learning of the break in the wall, attacked. Archaeologists have noted in observing the site that the evidence of this flood is the stratum of pebble and sand found a few feet below the surface of the river in the mounds of Nineveh. An event exactly as Nahum described. The city was to be burned with fire. The Malawan expedition records the following observation concerning the excavation of the Assyrian king's throne room, a remarkable record by the first people to see the building site since it was destroyed in 612 BC. The condition in which we found the throne room was a dramatic illustration of the final sack. The wall plaster had been packed hard and burnt yellow by the flames and then blackened with soot which had penetrated into the brickwork itself. The intense heat had caused the south wall to bend inward and the floor of the chamber itself was buried upon a great pile of burnt debris over a meter and a half in depth, filled with ash. Never have I seen so perfect an example of a vengeful bonfire, the soot still permeating the air as we approached. Nahum was right yet again. There were two remaining predictions made by Nahum. When we come back, we'll examine their remarkable fulfillment, which has, as we will show, amazed even modern historians. In the meantime, here is how you can acquire your own copy or electronic version for today's offer, The Power of Prophecy. This clear and straightforward resource will help you understand this vital truth straight from the pages of the Bible. Call now or go to TWTV.org slash power. Thus far, we have seen how four prophecies made by Nahum came true as verified by archaeology. Nineveh would fall quickly. Drunkenness would be a factor in Nineveh's collapse. A terrible flood would be a factor in the city's fall. And fire would play prominently in the city's destruction. Now let us take a look at the last two predictions Nahum made while Nineveh was still a great city and the center of the great Assyrian Empire. The fall of Nineveh would be its end. It would never be rebuilt. Even Nineveh's ruins would disappear as if they had never been. The well-known resource, Unger's Bible Dictionary, makes this comment. In 612 BC, the ancient capital of the Assyrian Empire was so completely obliterated that it became like a myth until its discovery by Sir Austin Layard and others in the 19th century. The fall of Nineveh occurred with remarkable speed, but its disappearance was thought of by many historians as one of the great mysteries of the ancient world. If such a place existed, how could it have vanished from view? Some explorers looking for the ancient city are now known to have passed right over its ruin without realizing it. Even now, archaeologists have to dig through between 30 to 40 feet of debris before the layer containing ancient Assyria comes into view. The renowned historian Will Durant, in his first volume of his landmark series, The Story of Civilization, writes the following. Nineveh was laid waste as ruthlessly and as completely as her kings had once ravaged Susa and Babylon. The city was put to the torch, the population was slaughtered or enslaved, and the palace so recently built by Ashurbanipal was sacked and destroyed. At one blow, 
Assyria disappeared from history. Durant goes on to make this remarkable statement. 200 years after its capture, Xenophon's 10,000 marched over the mounds that had been Nineveh and never suspected that these were the site of the ancient metropolis that ruled half the world. Not a stone remained visible of all the temples with which Assyria's pious warriors had sought to beautify their greatest capital. Even historians and well-educated travelers who were looking for the sites of the ancient Assyrian Empire could not find evidence. Note, even scientifically minded travelers who know from the Bible the existence of Nineveh attempted to find it and several times passed over the very ruins without knowing it. The fulfillment of all six of Nahum's predictions in great detail proves his work cannot possibly be dismissed as just the imaginings of a man. Our special offer today provides much more evidence that the Bible is indeed a work that is supernaturally inspired. Take this opportunity to obtain our free DVD resource, Power of Prophecy, also available as an electronic download. The disappearance of Nineveh was labeled one of the most bewildering riddles of history. So complete was its burial that Iraqis are now known to have built a small village atop one of the mounds never realizing they were living on top of one of the greatest cities of the ancient world. It is amazing that an ancient Israelite named Nahum could have known the specific details of Nineveh's demise a decade or more prior to its fall, and that it would completely disappear from history. Without divine help, no Israelite seer could have penned all these events and then made them come to pass on such a scale with a precision over 2,400 years. The fifth and sixth predictions provide final proof that his writing had to be a product of inspiration. It seems from the record that the book of Nahum is one that can be trusted. If that is the case, perhaps the rest of this text, which has so profoundly influenced Western culture, should be taken a bit more seriously. Thank you for watching and I encourage you to join us next week when Gerald Weston, Michael Haycoop, and I will bring you more about the truth of the Bible and the great news it contains about a glorious future open to all in tomorrow's world. For today's free offer, call 888-459-5726 or go to twtv.org power. Call today and join millions around the world who are turning to tomorrow's world for truth, prophecy, and hope in these confusing times. The preceding program is produced by The Living Church of God.